Hello everyone, I'm Jesse Mason, and for today's episode of Teach Me, we're on the campus of Oakland Community College in Farmington Hills, Michigan. We're here to gather data to determine a car's initial speed before its wheels lock up, bringing the car to a skidding halt. We'll measure the length of the skid marks and also determine an experimental value for the coefficient of kinetic friction between tires and road. Then we'll use Newton's laws and kinematic equations to determine the car's initial speed. Lastly, we'll compare our results to a value obtained during the skid using a radar gun. First, we'll generate the data. So let's draw a picture of what just happened. We'll start with the road. And here we have the DeLorean, <clears throat> I mean the Civic, traveling along the road at some unknown initial speed, when all of a sudden the driver slams on the brakes, causing the wheels to lock up, which eventually brings the car to a skidding stop. Before we forget, let's indicate a coordinate system on our drawing. We'll indulge our contrarian tendencies and assume an inverted coordinate system, with the origin placed at the rear tire at the car entering the skid. To keep things simple, we'll also use the rear tire to mark the initial and final positions of our vehicle. Good. Now as the tires skid along the ground, the coarse concrete scrapes off tiny bits of rubber, leaving a trail of rubber behind the skidding tires, just like a crayon does when scraped along a piece of paper. So skid marks are kind of like coloring with your car. Oh, and let's not forget that the front tires were also skidding. We need to account for that in our calculations. Now let's get out the measuring tape and collect some data. So from beginning to end, demarcated by the orange spray paint here, we have an overall skid mark length of 14.70 meters. That's almost 50 feet of rubber. We'll label this length on the picture as L sub S and write L sub S equals 14.70 meters. And of course, this value is longer than the displacement of the vehicle due to the fact that both front and rear tires are leaving skid marks. So we also need to measure the length of the car's wheelbase. And when we do, we find that the distance from the bottom of one tire to the next is 2.60 meters. We'll indicate that like so. So we're given a couple values for motion here. Let's see how far we can get with just kinematic equations. Since we don't have a value for time, that is how long the car was decelerating, the obvious choice from the big three kinematic equations is the time independent equation. So we write V sub X squared equals V sub O sub X squared plus 2 times a sub x times quantity x minus x sub o. Since x sub o and the origin coincide, we can set x sub o to 0. And x, the horizontal displacement of the body, is simply the overall length of the skid marks minus the length of the wheelbase. And though I neglected to write it here, v sub x, the final horizontal velocity of the vehicle, is 0 because it comes to rest at the end of the skid. Subtracting the term on the right and taking a square root gives us v sub o sub x equals the square root of negative 2 times a sub x times quantity l sub s minus l sub w. Hmm, we don't have a numerical value for a sub x, so we're not fully equipped to solve for initial speed just yet. To get a sub x, we'll need to use Newton's second law applied to the skidding car, which means, you guessed it, we need a free body diagram. First, we isolate the body from its environment. Then we depict the forces acting on the body. Here we've got weight pulling the car downward, and because it's on a steady level surface, we've got an equal but opposite normal force acting on it. By the way, isn't it tempting to think that those two forces constitute a Newton's third law pair? Don't be fooled, weight and normal force are never a third law pair. Finally, we've got friction kinetic friction to be specific, because the two surfaces, road and tire, are slipping. Kinetic friction opposes the velocity of the vehicle, so it's directed to the right. This kinetic friction is an unbalanced force, so it shouldn't come as any surprise that it accelerates the vehicle, or decelerates if you prefer. Lastly, we'll indicate our chosen coordinate system on our FBD and proceed with Newton's second law. Applying Newton's second law to the y direction, we get the sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. Of course, the car isn't accelerated up or down, so we set a sub y to zero. In the positive y direction, we have normal force, and in the negative y direction, we have weight. 
And so we're left with the familiar result that the normal force on the vehicle is equal to the weight, which is just mass times gravitational acceleration. Applying Newton's second law to the x direction gives us the sum of the forces in the x direction is equal to the product of its mass and its acceleration in the x direction. In the x direction, we just have the kinetic friction force, and it's anti-parallel to the positive x-axis. So we write negative f sub k equals m times a sub x. Solving for a sub x and substituting our expression for kinetic friction gives us a sub x equals negative mu sub k times n over m. Since we've shown that normal force equals m times g, we can substitute that expression for n. And when we do, we discover that mass divides out of the equation. The physical revelation here is significant. No matter the vehicle or the amount of junk in your trunk, once you're skidding, you're at the mercy of the coefficient of kinetic friction. We likely would have missed this insight had we inserted numerical values earlier, which is one reason we always solve symbolically first. Okay, now we have an expression for a sub x, and wouldn't you know, it's negative. Now we just need a value for mu sub k. Of course, we could just look it up in a textbook or find it online, but that would be somewhat inaccurate, and more importantly, totally lame. To determine mu sub k, the coefficient of kinetic friction between tire and road will use a piece of tire and a spring scale. Dragging the tire along the road by the spring scale will yield a value for the force due to kinetic friction. It's about 10.5. Suspending the tire by the spring scale will yield the weight of the tire, about 12 and a half. And assuming that there's no vertical acceleration, we can say that the weight of the tire is equal to the normal force of the road acting on the tire. Okay, let's draw this bad boy. We've got a piece of tire from the skid here, and it's being pulled horizontally along the road by a spring scale at constant speed. This information is critical. V equals constant. Before we forget, let's choose a coordinate system for our trunk tire. Since we're moving left to right, positive x to the right will be the easiest. We'll write the tension on the tire due to the spring scale right here, 10.5 newtons, and the weight of the tire right here, 12.5 newtons. Since we're analyzing forces, we'll need a free body diagram. So the forces acting on the tire are weight, downward, normal force, upward, tension force to the right, and kinetic friction, opposing the motion, so to the left. We'll depict our coordinate system, and since velocity is constant, that means acceleration equals zero. Good. So we've got a picture with our knowns and unknowns, a free body diagram. The next step is the equation step. We'll use Newton's second law of motion. Analyzing the y direction first, we get the sum of the forces in the y direction, equals the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. Since it's not accelerating, a sub y is zero. Summing the forces, we get n minus w equals zero. So the normal force is equal to its weight. Next, we analyze the x direction. Sigma f sub x equals m times a sub x. Again, a equals zero, therefore a sub x equals zero. Summing the forces, in the positive x direction, we have tension, and in the negative x direction, we have kinetic friction. Adding f sub k to both sides and substituting our expression for kinetic friction yields t equals mu sub k times n. Since n equals w, we can write t equals mu sub k times w. Rearranging this equation to solve for mu sub k, we get t over w. Entering our values for tension, 10.5 newtons, and weight, 12.5 newtons, gives us an empirically determined value of 0.84 for the coefficient of kinetic friction between our tire and the road. No need to check friction coefficient tables. How slick is that? Now we can solve for the car's initial speed. Inserting our values into the equation yields v sub o sub x equals the square root of negative 2 times negative 0.84 times 9.8 meters per second squared times quantity 14.70 meters minus 2.60 meters n quantity. That gives us a value of 14.1 meters per second, or about 31.5 miles per hour, for the velocity of the car entering the skid. Now, how does this theoretical value compare with the actual speed of the vehicle? To find out, we asked the Farmington Hills Police Department to capture the car's speed as it entered the skid with a radar gun. 
And 30 miles per hour is the radar reading upon entering this skid, which means that our measurements and calculations put us within 5% of the clock speed. I'm Jesse Mason, and I hope you like this video. If you'd like to make a suggestion for future Teach Me videos, or just want to say hello from your part of the world, please do so in the comments section below. And as always, happy learning. <laughs>